Hello, my dear students, and welcome to a new uh, lecture and actually a new chapter in our selective topics in uh, electronics module delivered to senior students. Actually, if you um, remember what we have uh, considered in the previous um, uh, parts or in the previous chapters of this module, maybe we started our module with um, sensors, with uh, a, a, a focus on what we can call a CMOS based sensors. We consider biomedical, uh, environmental temperature and different uh, sensors, technologies. And then we go to a second chapter with a bit toward RF electronics, mainly toward tuned amplifier, where we also explore a very important pa um, parameter or maybe feature in the a CMOS technology, which is a parasitic capacitance associated to both um, at, uh, MOSFET and BGT uh, devices and Miller capacitance effect and how we can uh, resolve this Miller capacitance effect and then how we can uh, consider it in our RF design. And finally, uh, in this final stage in the course, we are still towards CMOS technology. However, we are going to consider, to consider more toward the, the technology itself. And in this beginning lecture for the third chapter, we are going to demonstrate, or we are going to try to answer a very simple question, which is how we can fabricate a device using the CMOS technology. Uh, Actually, the fabrication process is a very fundamental and important process in electronics industry nowadays, either considering the analog electronics industry or the digital electronics industry as well. And maybe in the next uh, lecture of this chapter, we will consider different delaying uh, processes associated with the parasitic capacitance in the digital electronics environment as a very shallow introduction toward digital IC design. Maybe this is might be a postgraduate level course for your um, for those who are interested with more toward electronics in this field or mainly digital electronics. But the question is now why it's important to to study this CMOS technology or the fabrication technology of an IC design. Maybe from one hand, you can consider that those who are working in such environment, of course, should know this process deeply so that they can master the process of fabricating IC uh, chips. Uh, and these types of fabricators, we call it fabs, where there is the pipelining process of fabricating different IC technology. However, what is also important that even the fabless companies, what we call a fabless company is simply these, those companies who are dealing only with the design. I mean, they are terminating on what we can call the layout, which will be a part of our study in this chapter. So still with the fabless companies, it's very important to know this fabrication technology because as we see in previous chapters, and as we are going to see in this chapter as well, the fabrication process impacted the design process in different parameters related to capacitance, resistance, maybe even layouting and all this stuff, which we will be, which will be part of our um, uh, study maybe in this chapter. So it's not only those related to fabrication are concerned with the fabrication technology, but also those related to fabulous design are still are, are still concerned to know some information about the fabrication technology. So let's start the process. First of all, I think most of you know or hear about the word VLSI or very large scale integrated circuits, but let's explore what is the source of this process. Maybe 
Years ago, when we started the electronics track together, early in solid state electronics, and maybe after that with different analog electronic modules, we were concerned to what's called the Moore's law. If you remember Moore's law was related to the estimation of the number of transistor per unit area to be doubled within 18 months duration. And we have discussed and explored together that the concept that increasing the number of transistors in the same area will directly impact the utilization and the efficiency and the processing speed for the circuits either analogly or digitally. And herein, we start to make some sort of terminology that express the density of electrons per unit area. Starting with small scale integrated circuits, medium scale, large scale, very large scale, ultra large scale, giga large scale. Now we are reaching what we can call hundreds of tera large scale. Nowadays, we can expect that per each person, per, per, per each human on the earth, there is correspondingly 10 power 19 transistor, which is 10 billion transistor per each uh, uh, per each human being. So we, you can expect to what extent. Now we are going deeply into ultra and ultra uh, billion uh, or ultra, ultra giga large scale um, integrated circuits. Here, I think. It's very interesting to know how we can reach this complementary mass technology. I believe that this slide, somehow you see it before in electronics one and in maybe in this module as well, when we refresh together what's called the CMOS technology. But now we are, we are going to go in the process of constructing such a device. So this technology, is called, or we call this technology as a planar technology, where you um, distribute different devices, different transistors in a planar way. The main selling edge of this planar technology is the speed of repeatability. As you can fabricate billions of transistor across the surface of a silicon wafer, at one step, because simply you are building transistors as a repetition of a pattern process. And this we will explore this as a part of the lithography process later. So this is the main advantage of the planar technology. So in a very simple way, this is the overall story of a planar technology. Starting with what we can call a silicon wafer with silicon dioxide, as an insulator, then selecting the region at which you are going to locate your design, your, your device, remove silicon dioxide from this region, it starts to make doping, and then you have a doped region. These are the main steps used in order to make what we can call a selected process in your wafer. You are selecting a certain area in your wafer or a certain surface in your wafer where you are intended to process some sort of a processing. For some example, here we are doing what's called the doping effect. So let's start exploring this process step by step. And then let's see how we can use this process in order to fabricate a simple electronic device. So the first step, as you can see here, my dear students, is what's called silicon dioxide oxidation. So simply we have a silicon wafer. Usually this silicon wafer is in a form of a desk, as a, a, a circular desk. So a first stage is to cover this desk with a silicon dioxide layer, which is simply a process of oxidizing silicon to be converted into silicon dioxide. Such oxidation process can happen in two different ways. The first is with a direct reaction between silicon and oxy oxygen to form silicon dioxide, and this we call 
a dry oxi oxidation process, or it can be with water vapor, still having silicon dioxide and hydrogen, where we call it the wet, wet uh, oxida oxidation process. This can happen either in a form of a vertical or an horizontal furnace, as you can see. What's really important for us as an electronic designers here is how we are going to control the thickness of that side. Flashing back to the previous lectures we demonstrated together this in this module, we considered that the thickness of, of, of the oxide is a very key parameter in the MOSFET and or the BGT design as the oxide layer is a, so, a, a, a critical source of capacitance or what we can call a parasitic capacitance in our design. So controlling that thickness of, of the oxide is a key parameter in our design. Here is how the process is going. We have oxygen and we have a nitrogen and we have a water. Here, this process is evaporating water and then water vapor is uh, uh, inserted in the presence of the wafer under a certain temperature. Then hydrogen will go outside, making this uh, or making the top layer of the wafer to be oxidized in a form of a silicon dioxide layer. And in order to control the thickness, as you can see here in my, my dear students, you have a set of parameters that can influence the thickness, such as the furnace temperature, the oxida oxidation time, the time at which the wafer will spend on the, in the, uh, in the uh, oxidizer, the uh, gas, the ambient gas and the orientation of the surface. These factors influences or impact the rate of grass or in other words, the thickness of the oxide layer to be uh, oxidized in the silicon wafer. So this, as I mentioned, very important parameter and usually we use these charts in order maybe you will you will solve some problems in during your tutorial session uh, concerning the um, oxidation uh, process and how you can control the thickness of this uh, oxidation process in terms of uh, these different parameters, as you can see from this chart. The second process is what we can call the selectivity process. Now we cover the whole wafer with silicon dioxide. However, we still need to remove this silicon dioxide from a certain or from a selected portion of the wafer so that we can start performing our device in. Here, we need to make a selective remove, uh, removing. We need to, to, to remove a selected area in the wafer. And this process, we call it lithography, which are the most expensive and the most critical and the most accurate process during fabrication. How you can select this process? Usually, we can implement this lithography in different techniques, and those who are going to be in the near future more oriented to clean room uh, fabrication may study advanced courses related to optical lithography, nanoprint lithography, electron beam lithography, and different lithography techniques. However, in this short introduction, we are going just to demonstrate a very brief description concerning the lithography process in general, mainly the most uh, traditional lithography way, which is the photolithography or the optical lithography. The lithography process is dependent, or the optical lithography process uh, uh, specifically, is dependent on what we can call a photoresist. This photoresist layer is to, to be deposited over the silicon dioxide layer, the oxide layer of the wafer. And herein we have two techniques of the photoresist. What we can call, my dear students, the positive photoresist and what we can call the negative photoresist. As you can see from this graph, in a positive photoresist, you are going to cover the area at which you are going to remove the uh, sorry, you are going to, 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 to cover the area from which 
you are you are going not to remove silicon dioxide. So you remove silicon dioxide everywhere and keeping only this area still with silicon dioxide, which is the blue layer, as you can see in this graph. So this is the concept of photoresist. However, in the negative photoresist, you are doing the reverse process. So the area not covered by the photoresist is going to be removed, and the, the area covered by the photoresist will still be kept, as you can see here in the negative photoresist. So it depends on your pattern. You can have a positive pattern or a negative pattern. You can have a pattern to cover the area where you still need silicon dioxide, or you can have a, a pattern to cover the area, uh, so, so not to cover the area where you don't need the uh, silicon dioxide, as you can see from here and from there. As I just mentioned, this process is very um, precise process and extremely expensive. Typically, whenever you are considering a pattern in the nanoscale. Usually there is a factor or there is a equation where we can determine the resolution of the lithography process. Usually it's called K times lambda. K is a coefficient related to different factors related to the photoresist, the material, the device and so on. And lambda is the ultraviolet wavelengths used for the photoresist. Usually we have lambdas in 190 something nanometer for this process. So we can, you knowing K, you can estimate the resolution for this process. Typically, as I as just mentioned, the photolithography is the traditional lithography way with not so high resolution and acceptable resolution, usually in the hundreds of nanometers, sometimes in the micrometer range. Whenever you are going more and more toward a deep nanoscale lithography, so you can go to electron beam lithography, which is more sophisticated. And maybe from the name, you can recognize that instead of having light beam, you will have an electron beam in order to perform the lithography. And finally, we have what's called the nanoprint lithography. And again, from the name, you can imagine that this nanoprint lithography is typically used for nanodimensional scale. For example, in optics, maybe you, you can search for what's called the photonic crystal structures. For example, 3D photonic crystal structures are very famous. Uh, with these nanoprint uh, patterns. But I, as I just mentioned, this is one of the most expensive processes during fabricating, I say, or during fabrication in general. So this is the concept of lithography. A second version is now we have, a, or we need to remove, as you can see here, we remove a photoresist. So for example, this area is covered with a photoresist but we still need to remove the other blue area as we do here. Or for example, here we need to remove this area as, as you did. How we are going to remove this unneeded uh, or not needed silicon dioxide region? How we can do this? We are doing this about what's called pattern transfer, what's called etching. Etching can have one of two ways. What we can call an wet etching, which is a, 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 a sort of a chemical etching. For example, for silicon, HF, is one of the most famous and very dangerous, by the way, uh, chemicals in order to perform etching in silicon dioxide. And you can also have what we can call a dry etching techniques. One of the very famous dry etching techniques is what's called uh, reactive ion etching or RI. But here, this a reactive ion etching, by the way, this is what we can call a reactive ion etching. But let's go to this slide now. There is a major difference between making a dry wet aging or what we can call between packets isotropic aging and what we can call an anisotropic aging or dry aging. The process is simply, or we can understand this process in a very simple way. Wet aging, which results with an isotropic aging, the, the, the figure to the left, is a chemical process. So you are simply uh, reacting your silicon dioxide with HF, which is a material to react and to remove simply uh, that silicon dioxide. However, 
you can understand that in this case, you cannot control this wet etching process. So what will happen in this gaps, as you can see, you will not have a sharp edges for the silicon dioxide. However, you will have these curvy shapes for the silicon dioxide borders. And please don't forget that this, if we return back here, this is a very important uh, uh, this is a very important um, uh, slide to remember. Here, this a curve, a curved. Assume that you have a curved structure here instead of having a sharp edge. You have a curved structure here. That means that simply your doping will going to diffuse. As we will, we will consider this later on in our next slide when we consider what calls the diffusion effect, the doping diffusion or the doping diffusion effect. So having these gaps may be considered somehow a con or a disadvantage for the isotropic aging because isotropic aging will act to have this curved structure where in next stages when you are going to do some sort of uh, annealing or depositing for example metal or doping or whatever you will start to have a parasitic capacitance effect due to this cur curved silicon dioxide or oxide, generally oxide layers, as you can see here and there in these areas. However, on the other hand, dry aging using either either reactive ion aging, RIE, or plasmonic, plasmonic aging, results with a very sharp edges. By the way, this is a real image. This is a real SDM or scanning electron microscope image in a micro scale showing here a very sharp oxide layer in the presence of the substrate down, sir, down down here, as you can see. So this is a very good advantage for the RIE or the reactive ion aging. However, reactive ion aging may influence the down bottom substrate, which is silicon. If this process is not highly controlled in terms of time, it might impact the substrate itself, and this is one of the disadvantages for the uh, plasmonic or the reactive iron aging with respect to the, the uh, 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 dry aging or the isotropic aging on the other end. Okay, now we have cleaned this in between region from silicon dioxide, and we start. We are now start to process the area, the selected area. So the next step is what we can call doping. Definitely, all of you know physically what means by doping by adding some sort of impurity to the material to convert it either to n type or repeat time. But what we are going to show now is not the physical concept of doping, which I'm sure that all of you know about it. But what we are going to show now is that how we perform doping into a silicon wafer. As other techniques as well, any process or any stage in this CMOS technology fabrication process can have different alternatives. But one of the most famous alternative here is what we call the ion implementation. Again, I'm not going to go into the physics of this. This is a very sophisticated process, but in a very simple way, you are going to shoot your wafer, silicon wafer, with a beam of the impurity material either a third group or a fourth group with an extremely high velocity so that your impurity atom penetrates the material, dislocates the original silicon atom, replace it by a third or, fourth, uh, third or fifth group material. And definitely in order to perform that, this, you have to have a very high input voltage. Usually here, the, the energy in terms of kilo electron volt. You can, if you understand semiconductor well, you can definitely know that kilo electron volt is a very high energy for a beam to, to be uh, uh, projected into a silicon wafer. And again, here you can have these controlling curves to show what we can call the doping profile in such a material. So here is the thickness of the material. And as you can see, here is the level of concentration. Definitely, you are not going to have a exact uniform doping 
if you flash back some years ago, you will remember what we can call the doping profile. We study the doping profile, if you remember, in order to study the diffusion in the Durf diffusion model some years ago. So these are the doping profile. Usually it has some sort of a Gaussian beam. And as you can see, the higher the energy of the ion implementation, the higher the penetration of the doping into the silicon region. This is clearly managed here. Yeah, let me show it. Uh, yes, here, yeah. So as you can see, you can never penetrate the whole silicon wafer to make it completely doped. You, are just, you just have what we can call a junction depth or a penetration depth. And this penetration depth depend on the energy adjusted by the ion, ion implementation process. So you can control your junction depths by simply controlling this energy uh, um, um, induced or energy uh, operated to uh, by the ion implementation uh, doping process, as you can see in this curve. And again, you have to remember that you will not have a uniform doping. Years ago, we were assuming a doping uniform. For example, if you remember, we say that assume a silicon wafer was ND equals cap power 17 or something like that. Definitely, this is just an assumption to make mathematics easy. But realistically, it is ha it has the form of it has the form of a doping profile, as you can see in this graph. So now we have or what, now we did the doping, but we have to recognize a very important feature to the doping. Again, it's somehow similar to what we call the isotropic effect in the etching. Again, we have this isotropic effect in the doping. Simply, when you um, when you are going to in, inject the ion implementation here, you cannot you can never guarantee that this doping effect will not go or will not diffuse below the silicon dioxide we, uh, silicon dioxide um, uh, insulator. And this is what we can call the doping diffusion. Again, my dear students, I believe that now all of you can understand the impact of that. You have a conducting layer and you have a silicon dioxide layer, which is an insulator. So if you if we do some sort of metallization here, if we add a metal layer here, then a capacitor will be formed here and that capacitor will be formed there. And that's why the study of such processes is extremely important in terms of design because all these impacts or the, all these effects should be studied and should be considered while making our circuit level design using cadence, mental graphic tools or multi-sum or whatever tool we are using, we have to consider such uh, uh, phenomena or such impacts in our design. So this is what's called the Dobin diffusion. Now, let's see, after we consider different processes, lithography, uh, etching, doping, all these stuff, after we consider all that, let's start together a process of fabricating a very simple electronic device using such a CMOS technology. In this example, we are going to demonstrate a process of fabricating a PN junction. And maybe my proposed homework for you is to use the same methodology in order to fabricate a CMOS transistor. I mean, a complementary NMOS and PMOS adjacently together in a form of, or in the presence of a silicon wave. So. Let's see the process of fabricating a silicon, uh, sorry, fabricating a, um, a, a PN junction using this technology. As a zero stage, we start with a silicon wafer. We have a silicon wafer. Then we are going to make a double oxidation layer to the silicon wafer. Maybe by the end of the story, you will know why we are going to, to make this silicon dioxide layer only also in the counter side. So we are making in the front side as well as in the counter side. Typically the same process, the first time on the front surface and the second time on the back surface. So this is the second process. Then we start the first lithography process. In this, again, if you remember, the lithography process is based on selecting a certain area 
to remove the silicon dioxide from this certain area and keeping silicon dioxide otherwise using what we can call a mask, as you can see. So we have a mask, we have a photoresist, and now we are intended to remove the photoresist from this selected area and keeping photoresist other way or keeping silicon dioxide other way, as you can see here by doing uh, uh, etching. So uh, we first make a mask, putting a photolithography, adjusting the mask and the photoresist, and then we do etching. The etching will result to remove this uh, silicon dioxide from this uh, unmasked area and keeping uh, silicon dioxide otherwise. Then, a process of doping. So we are going to dope our wafer. By the way, we are we here started with a P doped a P doped silicon wafer. And by the way, this is the most famous silicon wafer worldwide. If you search, if you just Google silicon wafers, you will find P doped highly P doped silicon wafers. So this is a very a realistic example in um, uh, silicon wafer technology. So now we have a B-type uh, B type substrate, but we intended, we are going to, to convert this region to be an N-type. So by, by doing this ion implementation, we will convert this to be an N-type. And if you are a good student with a good grade or a high grade in electronics module, you will know that we need this N plus because simply we have to make a doping with a donor level greater than or much greater than the whole level in order to convert this selected region from being an N, from being P type to be an N type. That's why this is N plus and this is B. And we usually, or we used to see this terminology in our semiconductor classes, different semiconductor classes from solid state up to electronic state. So this is N plus B junction as you can see. Then, and next stage again is what we can call aluminium sputtering. The sputtering process is a process of depositing some sort of a metal. Here we are using aluminium and we cover all the junction with this aluminium. But realistically speaking, it does make sense that you will have all this layer of an aluminium because simply this will result with a short circuit across the wafer. So a next stage is to again to mask this process. What well, the masking process will result to remove the uh, uh, the photoresist or remove the aluminium from the right and to the left, keeping only aluminium in the bottom, so that this will represent the electrode connecting the N plus region, as you can see, and you remove here the uh, aluminum parts from here and from there, keeping only aluminum in the metal. So this is the second case. But let's now describe a very important thing. Please take care. Here, we use what's called a positive photoresist. So here, if you remember, we block this and this, and we remove the area in between. However, here, we use what's called a negative photoresist. So we remove the area to the left and the area to the right and keeping only this in between, as you can see in this case with aluminum connecting to the N plus. And then we add an oxide layer. Maybe a very good question to, to be, uh, to, to be uh, asking now, why we need this oxide layer? Simply, you need this oxide layer in order to isolate your device from any neighboring device. Please remember that you are doing this process in a wafer where there is a billions of devices. So simply between each device and neighbor device, we should have an insulator in order to insulate the these device with respect to other devices on the same wafer or on the same chip. But, but by putting this oxide layer, we make the aluminum disappear. We still need an electrode. So again, we have to do a lithography in order to tunnel this area, as you can see, so they, that, that you can keep this aluminum connected as a N plus electrode or anode for this PN junction. Now we make an N plus terminal or an N plus electrode, but we still need an electrode that 
is connected to the other side of the PN junction, which is the P side. So now we are going to remove the oxide on the backside. If you remember in the first step, we put this oxide layer on the P side to cover the P side. But the question is, as far as you are going to remove this P side or the counter oxide layer, why you intended to put it from the beginning? And the answer here is very simple. The answer is to protect the silicon wafer. As you can see, the silicon wafer goes into different processes with ultra hot temperature and different um, external impacts. So in order to make sure that you are protecting your counter side of the substrate, you put the silicon dioxide layer to protect the, the silicon wafer, the silicon substrate from any external impact. Now, as far as you finalize all the proofs on the front side, it's time to go back to the counter side and remove this back silicon dioxide layer. Then we start to put another conductor. Here we use gold, for example, as a counter electrode to connect the P side of your PN junction. Finally, you have a two terminal for your device a terminal for the N junction and a terminal for the P junction. And this is simply summarized a full process for operating or for creating a PN junction. My question now, or maybe this is an introduction for you tutorial. You will have also different uh, um, numerical forms in the tutorial as well, but let's also insert this as a part of our tutorial uh, for this week, inshallah which how can we fabricate a CMOS pattern uh, transistor like this using the same story, using the same know-how. So start to think, my dear students, in what steps you need in order to perform a complementary PBOS at CMOS and, and, and NMOS transistor coupled together with insulator in between, as you can see. This is very interesting, by the way, to think about it. And I think you will learn a lot if you start to make this process. But what you can see, my dear student, that this process is not an easy process. In order to create a PN junction, we have to make a successive of 14 different steps with different processing. But Maybe one of the questions to come to your mind here is, as you can see, in this technology, we can make a PN junction. Definitely, we can make a BG BGT. We can make a MOSFET, an N MOSFET, a P type MOSFET, and so on. But if you remember, in some of our classes, I usually told you that the CMOS technology is constructed based on MOSFETs, not PN junctions. And if you remember some classes ago, we have discussed together the process of connecting the source, not the source, I'm sorry, connecting the base to the collector in a BGT in order to convert a BGT to be a die, we make it in the first lecture with the CMOS based temperature sensor, if you remember. And in this lecture, I told you that we do it because simply we don't need to have a PN junction in our CMOS technology. So we are still using a, a transistor and then we convert this transistor to be a most, uh, sorry, to be a die. But the question is, as far as you can do a die in your CMOS technology, why we should do a transistor and then convert it back into a die? Simply, the question or the answer is in what we can call the patterning process. What is the patterning process? So, in this stage, we are doing what we can call a mask in order to perform a certain device. As you can expect, this mask will be in the dimensions of micrometers, for example, 
millimeters. And if you remember, I told you that one of the main advantages of a planar technology is you can process billion transistor or millions of transistor at the same process because simply you are working into or are you are working on the planar surface of the silicon wave. So in order to make this process a speedy process, it makes sense to construct the same pattern across the whole wave. So for example, if we choose to have a MOSFET pattern, then we are going to spread this MOSFET pattern or this MOSFET mask across the whole surface of the wave, creating billions of MOSFETs in the same wave. So as a next step, in order to process this MOSFET, now you have to have any of your circuit elements in terms of MOSFET, because simply you choose to have a MOSFET in your, as a building block in your silicon wave. That's why in our electronics technology, we intended to make everything in terms of transistor. So you can make it a resistance in terms of transistor. You can make a die in terms of transistor, definitely amplifies and so on. And that's why we are considering the transistor as the main boiling point of our electronics industry. Because simply, whenever you make a pattern and repeat this pattern, you extremely speed up the fabrication process of your silicon wafer in different technologies, of course. Keeping the dimension of the transistor as the main critical parameter in the design. So the lower the dimension, the smaller the dimension, the higher the number of transistors per unit area, then the higher the functionalization and so on. That's all for this first lecture with an introduction to VLSI technology and a complete storyboard towards a fabricate, fabricating a CMOS device. In the next lectures, we are going to study the impact of this fabrication process into the design process. Definitely, or mainly from the digital perspective. We already consider the analog perspective in the previous chapter. So in this chapter, we are going more toward the digital perspective and how these capacitors impacted the digital uh, process of digital ICs. Thank you very much for your concentration and see you in next lectures, inshallah. Thank you very much.